thank you again for joining us as we continue the spring portion of the 2021 Lectures in Mathematics Education Series. Today's speaker is Dr. Eric Knuth, joining us from Texas. Uh, the Lectures in Mathematics Education Series is sponsored by the Herman and Rache Math Initiative and the University of Southern California's Rossier School of Education, with the goal of highlighting important research targeted at improving teacher effectiveness in mathematics education. We're thankful to be able to provide access to this series virtually and for our guest speakers and everyone joining us in this digital space. Today, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Knuth, who will be giving a talk titled The Development and Implementation of a Grades 3 through 5 algebra, Early Algebra Program. Dr. Knuth is a professor at the University of Texas, Austin, and is currently serving as a program director for the Division of Research on Learning in Formal and Informal Settings at the National Science Foundation. In addition, Dr. Knuth was the director of the STEM Center at UT Austin from 2018 to 2020. Prior to entering academia, Dr. Knuth spent several years teaching high school mathematics, as well as several years working as an electrical engineer. His program of research concerns the meaningful engagement of students in mathematical practices and the development of increasingly more sophisticated ways of engaging in those practices. His research focuses in particular on practices related to, the al to algebraic reasoning and to mathematical argumentation, justifying and proving. As primary goal of his work is to develop sufficiently detailed accounts of learning and instruction in classroom contexts to guide the development of instructional practices, curricular materials, and teacher education professional development aimed at facilitating students' mathematical development. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. And at that point, we'd like you to post those questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. Thank you again for joining us. And at this point, I'm pleased to turn it over to Dr. Eric Knuth. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Although I, as I said to Michael earlier in a conversation today, I was counting on being in Southern California today and seeing you all in person. So um, I guess this is the next best thing, doing it virtually. Um, so today I'm going to talk about an early algebra program of research that my colleagues and I have been engaged in over the past 10 plus years. Um, I'm also happy if you've got questions that pertain to a particular slide or a particular moment. I don't mind if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question. I'll certainly try to leave time at the end, but you know, feel free. I, it, you don't have to hold every question to the end if you've got a, a burning question that you want to ask at some point. So briefly, an overview of what I'm planning to talk about this afternoon is the algebra problem and a promising solution. What, it, what I mean by developing a comprehensive approach to early algebra, I'll give you an overview of the project LEAP and its various studies, and hopefully address the question to some extent of does early algebra matter? And then I'll talk about our program, a comprehensive program of early algebra, and then if there's time towards the end of kind of big pictures, uh, lessons learned from our program of work. So the plan for the talk, given the you know, relatively, I think, diverse audience anyway, with faculty, grad students, and perhaps some practitioners, is to discuss the research, its implications for practice, and the program of work uh, that we've been involved in. So briefly, the algebra problem is, as many of you probably already know, that too many students are unsuccessful in algebra, especially students of color. Algebra has long been the gatekeeper to future academic and career opportunities. And arithmetic in elementary school does not adequately prepare students for success in algebra in the later grades. In fact, there's been a lot of research about the abrupt transition from the concrete arithmetic reasoning of elementary school to the abstract algebraic reasoning of secondary school. So one of the solutions that's been proposed over the last 20 years or so is early algebra. And so um, if you're not familiar with early algebra, it's not a matter of moving that content and practices of algebra one into the elementary grades, but rather thinking about algebraic thinking as a K-12 strand Early algebra builds on students, on children's informal intuitions about patterns, relationships, and structure. And it needs to be long-term and sustained algebra experiences. So the early algebra research 
over the past couple decades has coalesced more or less around particular ideas and practices. So the idea of mathematical equivalence, often a lot of studies uh, focus on the equal sign. So Tom Carpenter and his colleagues, Carolyn Kieran, uh, myself and some of my colleagues have looked at kind of student understanding of the equal sign and how that plays out in algebra. The idea of general arithmetic, so things looking at properties and identities, students understanding about the parity of sums, so that two even numbers, the sum is an even number and being able to justify and generalize the result. So Deborah Shifter and her colleagues have focused on kind of the area of generalized arithmetic. Multiple representations, so understanding symbolic, tabular, and graphical forms of representing algebraic information. So David Karahar and his colleagues, for example, have done a lot of work in this area. And then the idea of functional thinking. So students' investigation and understanding of covariant quantities. So Jim Caput and his colleagues focused a lot of the early algebra work in this particular area. So this work has provided lots of insights about children's understanding of some of these fundamental early algebra ideas and teachers' ability to facilitate students' understandings. But some of the shortcomings of this work is that much of the early algebra efforts have not been comprehensive in the treatment of the algebraic content and practices. So again, what I mean by that is prior efforts tend to focus on a particular domain of early algebra. So as I mentioned, like the equal sign, Tom Carpenter and his colleagues focused on that, Deborah Shifter and her colleagues on generalized arithmetic, but they haven't looked comprehensively at a lot of these fundamental early algebra ideas and practices. They also have not been longitudinal in studying long-term development of student understanding. So much of the work has been in a particular grade level. So for example, looking at grade three children's understanding of mathematical equivalents or their understanding of um, you know, some of the generalized arithmetic. The efforts have also been researcher-led or researcher-intensive interventions. So prior efforts include significant involvement by researchers or research team, either in leading the in innovations or in, in the tech classroom working with the teachers. And finally, they are often not well integrated with the arithmetic-based curriculum that is typical of elementary school classrooms. So oftentimes it's the kind of algebra is viewed as maybe a Friday algebra day, but it doesn't build on and connect to the arithmetic-based curricular experiences that students uh, experience in a traditional elementary curriculum. So Project LEAP is a series, a decade-long series of projects whose primary goal is essentially to answer the question, does early algebra matter? So Project LEAP stands for Learning Through an Early Algebra Progression. And the specific question we are interested in addressing is, are students who experience a comprehensive and long-term early algebra education in elementary school better prepared for algebra in secondary school relative to students who experience a business as usual kind of traditional arithmetic curriculum in elementary school. So in the following slides, I'm, I will give a brief overview of three studies that are part of Project LEAP. So just as a kind of timeline, and so we're very kind of thoughtful in our acronyms, we have LEAP1, LEAP2, and LEAP3. So LEAP1 was our first project, LEAP2 was a follow-up of that, and then LEAP3 was the kind of cumulative kind of study at the end of these projects. So I'm briefly gonna talk about LEAP1 and LEAP2, and then I'll spend a bit more time on LEAP3. And then I'll also talk about three new projects that we have that are continuing the project LEAP work. So LEAP1 was essentially a proof of concept study. So in project LEAP1, we developed a comprehensive grades three through seven early algebra learning progression. We stopped at grade seven, thinking that oftentimes grade eight is when first year algebra occurs. So it's typically grade eight or grade nine. So we went up to the point of formal algebra in our early algebra learning progression. As part of this, we also developed early algebra learning progression based 
grade level assessments. We developed and tested the ELP, EALP lessons. So about 18 lessons per grade level. And then we collected proof of concept data. So we've studied six classrooms with about 300 students in grades three through five. And it was a cross-sectional study. So by what, what I mean by that, we couldn't implement the grade three curricula, follow those students in the grade four, then implement the grade four intervention lessons, and then follow those students in the grade five. Because of the funding cycle of the project, we did the development in the first few years, and then we tested the grade three materials in grades three, four, and five, with the idea of seeing, are students at this age able to understand a comprehensive approach to early algebra ideas and practices? So just briefly an outline of the development of the early algebra learning progression. So I'm not gonna go into great detail about this outline as that would be a whole nother talk. We've written it about it elsewhere. We had an article in Cognition and Instruction, for example, that kind of details our kind of learning progression and its development in the early algebra uh, progression. Essentially, we developed a curricular framework. So we identified the big ideas and core concepts of algebra. We developed a curricular progression. So we looked at what might we expect from students to be able to do at a certain grade. We developed an instructional sequence. So what sequence of tasks and lessons will lead students to this learning? We developed learning progression-based assessments. So we were interested in what will, how will we assess what students learn as they go through the progression? And finally, we identified levels of sophistication in students' thinking. So what are the levels that students exhibit as they advance through the learning progression? So this slide, I'm not expecting you to look carefully and be able to read everything that's on here, but the, these are just some pages from the lesson plan that teachers kind of implement and that we developed. So this is a sample of the kinds of support that they have. So there's things about the big idea of the lesson, the actual student activity, teaching tips, some of the common difficulties that students might have with some of the concept, some teaching hints. It was linked to the common core, for example, so that schools and districts would be able to identify where that fit in with their state frameworks or district frameworks. So essentially the primary result from the first study was that the results demonstrated that students in grade three students, the intervention starting point, were able to successfully engage with the early algebra concepts and practices. So again, that was our goal to see whether a comprehensive approach to early algebra, students would be able to handle the material that was presented to them. So in our second study, we decided to test our intervention in a quasi-experimental study. So in this case, we had a member of our project team taught the early algebra lessons. So in this case, we were testing the effectiveness of the early algebra intervention. It was a researcher-led implementation. So a member of our team taught the students in grade three, then taught those students in grade four, then taught those students in grade five. And so in this case, it was kind of a best case scenario. We have someone that's very steeped in the early algebra literature, knows exactly what's intended in the lessons. And so this was, if it's gonna be effective, by any stretch, this should be our best case scenario. So again, we followed 170, about 170 grade three students. So there were six intervention classes and four comparison classes. So the member of our team taught all six intervention classes. An assessment was given at the beginning of grade three and then at the ends of grade three, grade four and grade five. We also conducted yearly interviews with a sample of students to get into more detail than the written assessments might provide. And then we also collected state standardized test data so that we could see whether teachers implementing, or in this case, our researcher implementing the 18 lessons that were designed to be replacements. So it wasn't additional kind of math lessons that students were receiving, but rather 18 days of the regular instruction was taken out and replaced by our early algebra lessons. So what I'm displaying here is simply correctness. So this doesn't go into detail about the particular strategies that students used, but it shows the highlight 
it's the kind of the results, how students did on the early algebra assessment. So at pretest, there were no significant differences between the intervention comparison students. And then at each grade point, intervention students significantly outperformed the comparison students at each grade level post-test. And again, what's not shown on this slide, but our results show that intervention students demonstrated increasingly more sophisticated algebraic strategies than the comparison students did at each grade level as well. So I'll, I'll illustrate some of the assessment items and student responses when I get into the details of LEAP 3. And so essentially this is what I just mentioned about the slide that was just displayed. So I, I won't go into the, those details again. So LEAP 3 was the kind of culminating study of the first three kind of LEAP projects. So in this case, we are again testing the effectiveness of the early algebra intervention, but here it was a teacher-led implementation in grades three through five rather than a researcher-led implementation. It was a large-scale randomized control longitudinal study. So we followed approximately 3,500 grade three students through grade six. So we had 23 intervention schools and 23 comparison schools. And I note that it was through grade six Ideally, we would like to have continued to follow them into grade seven and potentially into grade eight. But as you can expect, funding cycles are three or four years in length. And so our funding was for four years. So we followed the students for four years. We also collected fidelity of implementation data. So we conducted observations with a random sample of 40 to 50 of the intervention teachers per grade each year, and we conducted approximately two intervention, two observations per teacher. Um, and then we also did monthly professional development for the intervention teachers. And the professional development primarily focused on the next lesson or two that they were gonna imp be implementing, kind of going through what to expect, make sure that teachers had any questions about the content covered in the lesson or the lesson itself. So it was kind of, getting them prepared to then teach that lesson over the next course of a month or two. So the assessment details, there were approximately 10 to 12 items per grade level. The items address the big ideas and practices that I mentioned earlier. There were a core set of items that went across the grades so we could track student performance on the same item across multiple grades, so grade three, four, and five. And then we also had non-core items that increased in difficulty across grade level. So in other words, there were items on the grade four assessment that students in grade three did not receive and they were meant to be appropriate for grade four students and likewise in grade five. Also keep in mind that the items were meant to be challenging for the students that we didn't wanna have, especially on the core set of items that we didn't wanna have a ceiling effect when students were in grade five that we would see 100% of the students doing, um, getting the items correct. So again, the big ideas we were looking at were equality, kind of dealing with expressions, equations, generalized arithmetic and functional thinking. And then the practices of generalizing, representing, justifying and reasoning with mathematical structure and relationships. So I'll show a few of the sample items just to give you an idea of what some of the items look like. So here were two items that focused on mathematical equivalence. So in one case, students were given the problem, fill in the blank with the value that makes the following number sentence true. How did you get your answer? And they were given the open number sentence, seven plus three equals blank plus four and asked to explain your answer. So if you're familiar at all with the research in elementary school algebra, students typically, the most common answer that students typically do is put a 10 in the blank because the equal sign is viewed as an operator, means the answer comes next and the plus four is often ignored by students. Or sometimes you'll see students add up all the numbers in, on both sides of the equation and then put that answer in the blank. And the second item was circle true or false, explain your choice. So 57 plus 22 equals 58 plus 21, true or false and explain your answer. So I'll show a couple examples of student responses. 
So here, as I mentioned, a very typical response for elementary students is to put a 10 in the blank and the student explains his or her answer by showing that they did seven plus three and got 10 and that's what goes in the blank. We see another student who, in this case, put the correct answer and explained it by seven plus three equals 10. So I did 10 minus four to get the answer. So the student kind of unwound the uh, equation to figure out that six went in the blank. On the second example, where 57 plus 22 equals 58 plus 21, a very common response, again, what's often called the operational view of an equal sign, is the student added 57 plus 22 and knows that's either computed or knows that's more than 58, so it's got to be false. Likewise, another common kind of student strategy on this one was to add up both sides of the equation and then compare. So in this case, the student added both sides, saw that they were equal, and then concluded that it was true. So I should say in the first response that was incorrect, that's a very common response that we see from elementary students. The second response is true, but it's not an algebraic response. In this case, the student is just simply computing both sides and determining that the equation is false. This third response from a student demonstrates what we see as a more algebraic strategy. So in this case, the student does a compensation strategy that the student recognizes that he or she doesn't need to compute both sides, that in this case, the student says they're just taking one from the 22 and then adding that to the 57. So in this case, there's no computation going on. The student recognizes the structural relationship demonstrated by the equation. Here's a couple sample generalized arithmetic items. So in the first case, circle true or false, explain how you got your answer. So this is also one that cuts across and deals with issues of equivalence as well, because likewise, a student that may hold an operational view of the equal sign may say that 31, 39 plus 121 does not equal 121, so it's false. But in this case, it was also recognizing whether students understand the commutative property of addition. And a second problem was students were given the statement, Brian knows that if you add any three odd numbers, you'll get an odd number, explain why this is true. So here we see one student's response, recognizing that it was the commutative property, but for students at this in this grade level, they were calling it a flip around fact. Here's another student that similar to the equivalence item, the student just added both sides of the equation and determined that it was true. For the problem with the three odd numbers, a very common and typical response from students is to test it empirically. So in this case, the student tried one example, added five plus seven plus three, got 15, and knows that that's an odd number and so concluded that the statement is true. So again, a very typical response for students at this grade level is to rely on empirical evidence as their method of justification. But we also see students in this case, the student is reasoning based on what would be commonly accepted facts in elementary school. So it's much more of a kind of deduction using axioms. So the student says, this is true because if you add any two odd numbers, you'll get an even number. And then if you take that even number, and if you add an odd number and an even number, then you're going to get an odd number. So the student is making a general claim based on known facts of odd plus odd equals even and even plus odd equals odd. We also saw students using kind of representational justifications. In this case, the student is using kind of a generic example where the student shows an odd number plus another odd number and shows it's got two leftovers and those two leftovers combine to then form or when you when you combine the odd and odd the two leftovers combine to give an even number and when you add another odd number you still have one left over so the student was using a generic example and representing it with a, an example that was meant to be generic but not particular And here's a functional thinking uh, assessment item. So the prompt was Brady is having his friends over for a birthday party. 
He wants to make sure he has a seat for everyone. He has square tables. He can seat four people at one table in the following way. And it shows the four students sitting around the table. If he joins another square table in the first one, he can sit six people. So there was a series of questions that I'm not displaying here just for lack of space, but there was a series of questions that then followed. So for example, how many people can sit at three tables, four tables, then a FAR prediction of 30 tables, and then they were asked to write a relationship between the number of tables and the number of people who can sit at the tables. So I'll show the last kind of question. So in this case, students were asked to write a rule that describes the relationship between the number of tables and the number of people who can sit at the tables. And here you can see one student uses the words adds two because you are adding two more at the end. And so the student in this case is, is viewing it as a recursive function rather than a covariant relationship. And here the student expressing it in variables does a plus b equals two. So in this case, there's no real meaning, at least from the researcher perspective, mathematically that's assigned to the variables that this equation doesn't make sense for the given problem. Here we see another student describing it as the number of desks times two plus two equals the number of people seated and shows the algebraic relationship D times two plus two equals P. So in this case, the student represented it in words correctly, shows the covariant relationship, and then shows correctly a symbolic representation of that covariant relationship. So if we look only at the core items, so again, these were the items that were similar in grade three, grade four, and grade five. We again see at pretest, there was no statistical difference between the students at pretest in the control and treatment conditions. And then at each grade point for the post assessment, the treatment students, it was statistically significant uh, differences between their, their um, performance at each grade level. And again, this is only correctness, so this isn't showing strategy. But we also noted that in addition to outperforming the control students with respect to correctness, treatment students also demonstrated more algebraic strategies in their responses than the control students. And we see somewhat similar results if we look across all of the items. The only difference is the correctness. This is again correctness. We see that correctness is attenuated in this case, that they didn't quite perform as well. But again, keep in mind that the items that go across the grade levels, so the grade five items were supposed to be challenging for grade five students, likewise grade four, and likewise the other items in grade three. So we did expect to see a drop in overall performance because of the nature of the items. And also the thing to keep in mind with this particular display is that we really can't compare year to year because there's different sets of items. So on the prior graph, we could look year to year and performance changes because these were core items. But in this one, because it was all of the items, we're really looking at only at in-grade performance differences. So again, brief summary, there were no significant differences between the intervention and the comparison student performance on the grade three pretest. Intervention students significantly outperformed the comparison students at each of the grade post tests in grades three, four, and five. Intervention students demonstrated more sophisticated algebraic strategies. And students in classroom in which teachers demonstrated greater fidelity of implementation outperformed students in lower fidelity of implementation classrooms. So at some extent, that makes sense that if a teacher is implementing the early algebra lessons more faithfully, you might expect the students in those classrooms to outperform students in classrooms where the teacher didn't do as good a job implementing the early algebra lessons. And again, we reported the results that I'm sharing here in a recent ARJ article that just came out earlier um, in 2019. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that we also collected data from the grade six students. And so I wanna share the grade six results that are 
interesting. And, you know, I'm happy to talk with more um, in the Q&A and also to hear if you've got any speculation about the grade six performance. So one of the things we see here is that there's a noticeable performance drop-off. If you look at the kind of increase in both the control and treatment conditions. So if we look at the treatment conditions in grade three pretest to grade three post-test, we see a very significant improvement. We see the significant improvement going to grade four. We see the significant improvement going to grade five, but we don't see that same kind of improvement going into grade six. We should note between control and treatment students, we do see a statistically a significant improvement between the grade six control students and the grade six treatment students, but we don't see that overall trend from grade three to grade six. And so it does raise the question of our original intent is does early algebra matter? It's a question of whether we see that payoff. It's an interesting, again, drop off in grade six in terms of the improvement that we kind of expected we might see given the grade three, four, and five data. Some of the things that we speculate about why we might be seeing a drop off in grade six is one potential reason is that grade six kind of curriculum may not address algebra in a very algebra concepts and thinking practices may not be a regular and consistent part of the grade six curriculum. And so in some sense, what the students, kind of the knowledge they gained from the grades three through five experiences may not be activated in the grade six curriculum. So if they're not kind of continually engaging in these algebraic thinking practices and uh, concepts, then they may not be kind of continuing to draw on those experiences. And so it may not show in kind of the post-test that was given at the end of the grade six school year. I mean, this is something that, you know, in hindsight, we wish we would have had funding to continue to kind of follow these students in grade seven and grade eight to see once they started getting into more algebraic concepts in grade seven and grade eight, whether that performance would have kind of picked back up. Because we certainly know we see kind of this in learning in other content areas where the, if the knowledge isn't activated, we're not going to see that kind of performance that we might expect to see. But again, it's something I'd be interested if any of you have kind of ideas on kind of what might be happening in the grade six data, I'd certainly like to hear those ideas. So again, one of the things I was just mentioning is the question of will early algebra have a payoff once students begin more formal early algebra or algebra experiences on a more regular basis when they're in grades seven and eight. One of the challenges that we had as part of this project, as I've already mentioned, kind of the funding challenges is our funding was for four years. So we were able to collect four years of data but it's hard to know in advance in order to put a proposal in essentially a year in advance of the finish of the study in order to possibly get it funded to kind of continue that. In hindsight, you know, it's easy to say, oh yes, we should have put a proposal in, but it's also hard to convince funders that kind of take our word for it, we're, we're gonna have good results and you should fund it so we can collect another two years of data. And as you may kind of imagine with longitudinal studies, especially large scale studies, there's also the challenge of keeping participants involved and kind of continuing to consent to have their data collected. And then school and district challenges as district leadership changes, their priorities may change and one superintendent may sign off to allow you to collect data and be working kind of with the teachers implementing the program but a new superintendent comes in, he or she may no longer have the same priorities and may not want to agree to have kind of the school year disrupted in a way that he or she may feel is not warranted um, given their other priorities. So I wanna just briefly kind of highlight some of the continuing work that we've been doing in our program of early algebra research that we're viewing as part of our comprehensive program of early algebra. So LEAP3 was the end of our kind of grades three through five early algebra intervention. We have two new projects that are looking to extend our work into the grades K2. So that we'll have a grades K5 early algebra intervention. 
So Leap 4 and Leap 4, Leap 4.1 is a IES funded project and Leap 4.2 is an NSF funded project. And then Leap 5 is a project in which we're looking at the fidelity of implementation data that we collected uh, and looking at that video data. So basically LEAP 4.1 is extending the early algebra work to grades K2. So we're developing the early algebra learning progression for grades K2. We're developing assessments in grades K2. And as you can imagine with grade two assessments, they're not written assessments, but we're doing kind of interview assessments given the children's younger age. And again, we're trying to extend that. So then we'll have the K5 early algebra learning progression and series of instructional lessons and tasks, as well as the assessments. In LEAP 4, we're extending the work to grade two, but we're also looking at for whom does early algebra matter? So in LEAP 4 2, we're paying particular attention to diverse student populations, both ethnically, ethnically and racially diverse, as well as diverse learners. So we're kind of thinking about students that may be identified as special needs students who are mainstreamed in classrooms, thinking about how can we design the early algebra learning progression to be attentive to those students as well. And then as I mentioned in LEAP 5, we're identifying from the video taped observations of the teachers implementing the early algebra lessons, we're trying to identify instructional practices that are correlated with students' early algebra learning. So again, in this sense, we're looking at those instructional practices that we can then, with the assessment data that we have, to correlate the student, the teacher practices with those. So we're trying to develop profiles of effective early algebra instruction. So being conscious of leaving enough time for any questions that you might have, I wanna uh, start to kind of wrap things up. I wanna talk about a little bit about just kind of the bigger picture of some of the lessons learned from the work. And this is actually lessons learned, not so much from kind of the early algebra, but the program of work in, in and of itself. So as I mentioned a little bit with challenges with long-term studies is the funding. We were fortunate enough to have the sequence of projects that allowed us to develop the proof of concept to then do a small scale quasi-experimental study and then to follow that up with a large scale kind of randomized study. We're hoping with our K2 extension to follow that same track record, but you know, who knows whether reviewers will kind of like the, what we're proposing to do and whether they'll continue to fund it so that we can kind of do the bigger scale study of our K2 intervention as well. I also mentioned kind of the challenges with participant involvement, being able to get students and their parents to sign on for longitudinal studies is also challenging as well as getting school, schools to sign on to that. And then the time involved. So the project, the grades three through five work has occurred over a 10 plus year kind of period. And so thinking about just to get this K-5 work kind of out in the field is a very long-term investment, both of kind of researcher time, but NSF and IES funding. So it's a really a long time commitment before this work actually kind of has a possibility of going to scale. There's also this idea of dissemination saturation. And what I mean by that, for us as faculty, you know, having to publish our work, we often will have reviewers say things like, oh, didn't, didn't I just read some of these results? And you know, for example, when we publish results from our work from the quasi small scale quasi-experimental study, then trying to publish the work that came out of the large scale kind of intervention similar assessment items, the same kind of learning progression. And so we're, you know, we're finding it harder and harder to find venues for publishing some of this work, even though it's new data, new results. But in the end, it's still, yes, early algebra, we're seeing similar kind of positive performance from students in our early algebra intervention. And also the idea of bringing the research to scale. And so I think this has implications um, that are kind of broad across a number of different kind of perspectives. So bringing research to scale in the sense of kind of trying to reach out to districts and teachers. How do you do that if we're kind of a, a team of five 
principal investigators, how do we reach teachers and districts in California, for example, or in the Midwest or in the Southeast? So it's you know challenging to think about, we've got positive results from our data. We've published our data in scholarly outlets as well as practitioner outlets, but how do we kind of get that to a broader audience? Likewise, we're thinking about publishing our materials. So luckily we've actually uh, found a publisher who has recently in this past spring, our materials are now published for grades three, four and five and are available. Uh, but even, so now it's kind of the publisher who is trying to publicize and kind of bring to scale kind of the work from our research. But I think the idea of bringing research to scale also speaks to doctoral preparation and training. That's something when I think about my own graduate and doctoral preparation, there were no classes I took or things that prepared me to think about how do I make my work accessible beyond the typical kind of publishing in scholarly outlets or practitioner outlets. So it's something to think about as faculty, how do we help prepare our graduate students to make the work, their work accessible to broader audiences on a larger scale. And it also speaks to teacher professional development. So we certainly found that not all the teachers implemented the lessons with fidelity. And so for something like this to have an impact on a larger scale, it really speaks to the need for larger scale professional development, which can be costly for districts, costly for states. And so how do we do that in a cost effective means? Because clearly, at least our research suggests that this early algebra intervention has had significant effects on student learning of early algebra concepts and practices. So I want to acknowledge the Project LEAP team. So my colleagues at Turk, Maria Blanton and Angela Murphy Gardner, and my colleague at UW Madison, Anna Stevens, and then Merrimack College, Rena Stroud. And if you're interested in learning more about Project LEAP, We've got information about the, the curriculum materials and the various publications that are available both on the websites at Texas and then one that's associated with UW-Madison. So at this point, I think I left about 14 minutes or so for questions. So I'm happy to go back to any slides if you have questions and I'll open it up to any questions you might have. All right, thank so you. At this very point, much. I'll, I'll okay. stop sharing, but I'll share again if needed. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Knuth. You can either uh, put your questions in the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself and share a question out loud. It's always nice if there's no questions. It just mean, it means I did a fantastic job of explaining everything you needed to know about the project. It was so clear. <laughs> we have a question here. Um, you stressed the close relationship between early algebra and arithmetic in these grades. Given your findings on FOI in terms of differences in algebraic practices in whole class scripted versus group individual, I wondered if you had any any data from the surveys about teachers' attention to algebraic ideas and lessons outside the implementation. We collected survey data from teachers, and we also analyzed the curriculum of the schools in which teachers were uh, taking part in the early algebra intervention. So we'd have an idea. One are the curriculum materials teachers using, do they incorporate any of the early algebra kind of ideas and practices? And then we also surveyed the teachers to see if they do anything above and beyond their curriculum materials where they may engage students in the early algebra activity. So it could be something that they're doing on their own, for example, or it could be a result from doing something in Project LEAP that kind of spurred them on to kind of seek out some additional resources. And so we surveyed teachers to get an idea how often and with what, you know, with what frequency and what are the types of kind of ideas or practices that if teachers did something above and beyond the LEAP lessons that were early algebra focused to get an idea of what was the concept or practices that were the focus of those lessons. And off the top of my head, I, I 
can't say, you know, X percent of the teachers seem to be doing early algebra practices above and beyond. But I will say for the most part that there wasn't a lot of early algebra going on in the traditional curriculum and teachers typically didn't do a lot beyond the leap lessons and then their, um, you know, curriculum that the school was using. Another question here. Uh, do you look at differences between schools and how the networks of collaboration at the school level might impact the FOI? So we looked at in, in so we didn't look at um, networks of collaborations at schools. I mean, none, none of the data that we gathered from schools asked things about whether within a district, you know, did the schools collaborate kind of with the neighboring districts. I mean, we did, you know, collect data with regard to, you know, demographic data of the schools and tried to match, you know, the treatment and intervention based on um, some of the statistical analyses, but we didn't look to see whether, you know, the I mean, I will say, so some of the data that we collected asked teachers about things like professional development opportunities that their districts offered. So we did collect data that gave us some sense of what kind of professional activities did the teachers have as part of their district? So even if it wasn't focused on early algebra, for example, maybe they were getting professional development with regard to kind of implementing best practices in elementary school. So we did want to get a sense of what kind of professional development experience and engagement teachers had at the different schools, but we didn't collect data with regard to collaboration kind of across schools, uh, whether there were things going on. We have a follow-up. Did you consider the role of the SBAC? I'm not sure what SBAC. It's a smarter balance uh, assessment. Uh, okay. uh, and it's given at the end of fifth grade. And in California, uh, elementary school is one credential, which is one through five, and secondary, then you specialize, and that's for six uh, and above. And the SBAC is given at the end of fifth grade is given I think in fourth and fifth grade but it's fifth grade graduation um, so if you're teaching to the SBAC which you might it's a high stakes test for uh, charter schools and for public schools mm -hmm. that are um, under examination for maybe going into receivership um, this is not necessarily going to be useful and, and children graduate from fifth grade and then they go to a different school in sixth grade where they might have a different teacher for math than they have for ELA and other su subjects. Whereas in first through fifth, they would have the same teacher for all the subjects. Right. And then they're working with, in sixth grade, they're also with students who had a different K through five preparation. So, so the semantics of, of like the, you were talking about one of the tricks of the uh, flip it or whatever, like, like those are those are little keywords that are used in some schools and not in others. But the SBAC is the main thing. Um, I did some hand grading for that and uh, the things that they count for how you verbally represent what you did are like surprising. But a lot of what you talked about uh, seems the, the difference between fifth and sixth grade is the SBAC is is key there. Yeah, so in, in our case, so one thing we did collect is I mentioned earlier, but didn't kind of mention it later in presenting any of the results, but we did collect standardized test scores from students. So it wasn't the SBAC, but the, you know, in the states in which we were collecting the data, their standardized tests. And so one of the things we were certainly um, cognizant of is both, you know, district leaders, teachers, parents, would, might be concerned if there was a drop, you know, if we're kind of taking out 18 days of math to implement the project leap lessons, we don't want to see a drop in the standardized test scores. And so uh, thankfully we didn't, you know, there was no kind of drop in student test scores. I mean, we we're kind of would like to have seen that student test scores kind of increase as a result of project leap, but we didn't see a statistically significant increase in test scores. But one of the things that people in early algebra will often uh, 
say is the work in early algebra also reinforces many of the ideas that students learn in arithmetic. And so, you know, we might expect to see some differences in the state assessments that weren't early algebra focused, but more kind of arithmetic focused. Yeah, I, what I'm actually trying to say is that accounts for the drop off in sixth grade. Yeah, so, I, so okay, it would, I, I, it would work yeah. to to make you pass the S back, but then in sixth grade, not. You see what I'm saying? Yep, yep, yeah. And I I, actually, it, that accounts for the drop in sixth grade. That was the question right. that I that you asked that I was yeah. addressing. Yeah. So I actually don't recall in the state whether the sixth grade assessments were higher stakes, for example, than they might have been in the elementary grades, because we certainly didn't see you know, the, the drop off and then the fact that they weren't teaching leap lessons in sixth grade, but it was the regular sixth grade curriculum that could certainly be, you know, um, it, yeah, I mean, that might be something we might look at the sixth grade standard state assessment to see, for example, whether if there were a focus on algebra, then that might kind of make my suggestion that maybe the algebra topics weren't addressed in sixth grade and so those ideas weren't activated in students and so um yeah that might be something that we might look look at and trying to address that idea in sixth grade what might account for the drop off and i do see the question at the david off no i mean so that wasn't something that kind of we looked at, I know Barb Dougherty has done a lot of work in kind of early algebra around um, those ideas and developed many curriculum materials around that. I wasn't aware that High had done much work with, with that. Um, but yeah, Barb, Barb Dougherty is someone that's done a lot of work with the Davidoff uh, kind of ideas and developed early algebra materials and elementary grade materials around those ideas. But that, but that didn't directly inform any of the work that we did. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, I, I'm, I'm looking in the chat too. So yeah, so certainly when the students left grade five, they kind of departed for different, you know, middle schools or junior high schools. And so, and then there's an influx of other kids coming in that had different experiences from different elementary schools. Um, yeah, so, and, and, you know, the elementary, I mean, there's a lot of differences clearly we know between elementary school and middle school or junior high school. So we have a good question here. Uh, how do state standards make the work easier or more challenging? So make the work of implementing early algebra or measuring, kind of implementing early algebra. So, I mean, I think of state standards, you know, and some states are incorporating more kind of early algebra ideas in the state standards. That certainly in that case makes it easier to implement some of these ideas and like our curriculum materials that have been recently published, it's easier for elementary schools to adopt these if their state you know, has standards that are kind of incorporating this. And that was one of the reasons in our developing, developing of the lesson materials that we tried to link those to common core standards because a lot of state standards were still kind of being developed in kind of being linked to common core standards, for example. And so we put that in to help teachers that may have an interest in trying to identify how it might be linked to some of the more common kind of national or state standards. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Knuth, for your time today and sharing your presentation on your work in early algebra. Um, so I would like to just share this uh, next slide here. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. Uh, you can join us for our final speaker in the series, Dr. Amanda Jansen from the University of Delaware, who will be joining us on March 30th, coming up here at the end of the month. Um, you can sign up the same way you've done before. And if you've previously signed up, you'll still receive the link as well. Um, so thank you again, everybody for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Knuth for your time and uh, your wonderful presentation.
Um, I think it sparked some great conversations and gave us some great things to think about as we head out of here. Well, thank you for kind of participating and attending and for the questions. And uh, again, thanks for the invitation. I enjoyed uh, the opportunity to share some of the work.